hola hello um and that's that's as, as far as i got in uh high school and other languages uh what up folks <laughs> welcome to the outside the box podcast i am jock slade and uh that intro was supposed to be a lot more eloquent it was a lot more eloquent in my mind uh but you know as uh, as with everything that i do on this show it was a complete and total train wreck but uh, I'm happy to be here regardless. Uh, as always, uh, this show would not be what it is uh, with just me. Uh, as you can tell by that intro, if that's any sign, if you've never listened to this show before, I promise that the show gets better. Uh, I just have to introduce the other two hosts on this show. Uh, that is Nick Ingvall and Tiffany Beers. Nick, let them know who you are, where they can find you, and all of that good stuff. Uh, I think you got to give yourself some more credit, man. Um, Nick, Nick Ingvall, uh, N-I-C-K-E-N-G-V-A-L-L on all platforms uh, and a site called Sneaker History, at Sneaker History on all platforms. But really, I'm just, uh, I'm more like what Jacques just described on this show, and I'm just like <laughs> picking knowledge off of these two. Um, and most importantly, we just get to hang out with Tiffany, which makes us cooler. Tiffany, go ahead and introduce yourself. <laughs> who was the first guy who spoke? I, Jacques, who was it? <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm Tiffany Beers. Uh, I've worked in the sneaker industry for over a decade. Uh, I worked at Nike as an innovator. Worked on lots of products you might be familiar familiar with, including auto lacing. Uh, you can find me on Instagram and YouTube at Tiffany Beers. Uh, I'm not gonna let that auto lacing slide. Um, <laughs> You could you could throw it out there like it's nothing, uh, but when she says auto lacing, uh, that includes all of the hypest product Nike Nike has ever created, basically in the last couple of years, uh, including the Hyper Adapt 1.0 and uh, the Nike Mag. And just in case you've never heard of a shoe that's basically going on resale markets right now for like twenty seven thousand dollars, but you know, auto lacing. Yeah, that's what it is, auto lacing. Uh, <laughs> as always, guys, we want to thank you for listening to the show uh we appreciate everyone that's been listening appreciate your feedback appreciate your questions appreciate you guys being so engaged with the show it really helps keep things going so with that being said we're going to get this show going and kick it off with today's apple launch uh so for those that don't know we do record this show before sunday when you guys hear it and uh today we had the launch of the new iphones there was the iphone xs i'm sorry the iphone 10s the iphone 10r and the iphone 10 s max um they've obviously changed the names and they also introduced the apple watch 4 now i am a big big proponent of the apple watch but that's just because i run um so i use it for every single run it helps keep track of my runs and i am addicted to closing my rings on the watch uh which it has somehow made it into my psyche and made me feel like I've actually done something for that day, <laughs> even if I haven't done really enough of what I should be doing that day. But if I close my rings psychologically, I'm like, I did something worth doing today. Um, the phones look pretty nice. It seems like it's just an incremental upgrade, nothing fancy. Um, but the really interesting thing for me, um, and you know, I'll toss this to you guys and let you guys jump in here, is the iPhone XR. It seems like what Apple is doing is transitioning so that there's no more home button and that a phone is just basically all screen. Now, they've already gotten rid of the headphone jack, they got rid of the hardware keyboard, and now they're getting rid of, of the, basically the last piece of hardware that was on the front of the phone, which is the home button. And as an iPhone 10 user, I'm, I'm gonna say I'm not exactly happy with the iPhone 10. I appreciate what they're doing, but I feel like it's too swipey. If that makes any sense. I don't know if either of you have an iPhone 10. If you can kind of jump in here before Apple totally bans me from everything. <laughs> I do not have an iPhone 10, but um, I can I can kind of relate. I mean, it's kept me from, uh, I guess, upgrading to the to the 10 just because I feel like there's at least for me, like I like having, you know, the, the home button and. I'm not like huge on the whole face recognition thing. You know, I think this is just a little too far, even though I know we're all we're all headed that way. But um, I'm I'm actually excited about the cameras in the new phones, and that will probably be what ends up getting me to uh, 
pre-order. <laughs> so I do not have an iPhone 10, and I don't. I can't even get the thumb thing to work on the home button. So I've never been appealing to get, you know, the face recognition. Like, what if you have other makeup on? Like, how, like you know, I don't know. i got so many questions for it. I feel like an old grandma because I'm just, like, refusing to adopt this new technology. <laughs> well, I will say the face recognition actually does work pretty well. It works with and without my glasses. Not that the glasses are a huge change to someone's face but it does work with and without my glasses so i i will say that that's been uh, a pretty cool sort of sort of thing um it is also frustrating though um so with the iphone 8 you can just kind of put your hand when the phone's laying down you can kind of just put your hand on the home button and it'll recognize your fingerprint and you can kind of scroll through it there and I know this is totally first world problems, but with the iPhone 10, you have to actually pick it up and like have it look at your face in order for you to kind of scroll through stuff or to see what's going on. Um, so that's a little bit of an inconvenience um, just because of my behavior of learn that learned behavior from kind of from the iPhone 8. Um, and thanks, guys, for making me feel like I'm like, you know, just wasting money getting an iPhone 10. I appreciate that, that this sort of love and uh, the camaraderie we have going on here. You're um, an early adopter. You, you are. Yeah. Oh, that, I am. I'll take that. I'll take that. That's one way to, to look at it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. Like this is one of those incremental upgrades where it's not a big change to the iPhone line. Um, but they are, I do, I did read today that they're getting rid of the headphone dongle. So for those, um, that had even a sliver of hope that the headphone jack would come back, um, (laughs) that's not going to happen. Um, Apple has AirPods to sell people. So unfortunately, if you wished for a headphone jack, it's definitely not happened now. They're even removing the dongle. So now you have to pay an extra $9 if you want to get the dongle. Um, apparently no one at Apple travels or goes on an airplane. Um, so they don't realize that you have to use the crappy airline headphones. Um, th- really first world problems here I'm complaining about. And I'm going to stop right now. <laughs> um, just realize what I was saying. Like, oh, I travel so much that I've got to use like, the headphones from the airline. Who am I? <laughs> Uh, what kind of trailer trash do you think I am that I've got to use? Okay, all right, enough of that. All right, um, but yeah. So I knew. I mean, I think I hope. I hope that it actually. Yeah. <laughs> I actually hope that it just like increases the battery life of AirPods, right? Like I just started using AirPods a handful of months back. I think they're great. I'm like, you know, I would say that like I don't want to go back to wired stuff ever again. But there are a few times where like. Like, if I'm sitting at my desk, you know, and wanting to listen to music, like, it's just better quality on an audio jack and a better set of headphones. But, like, the AirPods, like, to me are, are like, I don't know, like, maybe it's maybe it's just me, but, like, you get, like, maybe 45 minutes to an hour out of them. And yeah, a lot of times, like, I, I, I could potentially have, you know, between podcasts and music, I could have headphones in, like, you know, for, like half a day six seven hours a day even um but that's kind of my my concern of like the direction of things i also saw somebody and sorry i can't remember who tweeted this out but somebody said something about like when are we just going to get to the point of like like apple creating like choose your own device build your own device products because it's true like we're almost at that point right like we've the the new the new uh what's the the top of the line one the x R no XR is like the quote the entry max, level one. The max. Right? Yeah. It's like the Air Max. Yeah, so the Max is like potentially like a thirteen hundred dollar, fourteen hundred dollar phone if you get the top of the line version. And you know, then you have this like, you know, eight hundred dollar range it, it looked like, I think seven forty nine, seven ninety nine, something like that. Right. And yeah. and like <clears throat> that's just a crazy amount of money. Like for for I mean I, I realize that like you can get that value out of that phone. In a, in a week like the people that totally use the functions of a phone uh, like it's a it's a full-on computer you can run a business from it and never have to think about ever opening a laptop again if you didn't if you didn't want to you know but i just think that like we're getting to the point where like people want like the basic stuff so you're going to end up having like you know like a starting point of like six or seven hundred dollars and then you're just going to add on the features that you want you know the same way that you would build like a tesla or something right That'd be interesting. 
That'd be interesting about allowing you to. I although I don't think Apple would ever do that. I feel like they have they want too much control over the product that they produce that they would ever let you do that. Although I think a lot of people would like that. Um, I mean, you kind of do that when included. you build like a laptop or or an iMac, right? Well, to an extent, though, but it, that but like it's all like very controlled. Like you can't pick the sort of video card that you get. It's only yeah. the one that only the one, literally the one that they offer. And it's more about like sizes. It's more like, oh, do you want sixteen gigabytes of RAM or do you want thirty two gigabytes of RAM? Yeah, that's do you want two hundred and fifty gigabytes of storage or do you want four terabytes of storage? And speaking of four terabytes of storage, uh, the new iMac. Like just to get four terabytes of storage is a two thousand dollar bump. It's Ooh. almost basically the price of the machine. <laughs> it's like the price of the machine by itself just to get four terabytes of storage, which blows my mind. I don't even, I don't understand the logic or the pr- why. And anyway, but it's yeah, like, it's so, the size, yeah, that's right? That. Yeah, it's the yeah, size. But, four, but that doesn't make sense. Like, yeah. doesn't make sense to me at all. Yeah. Is that, anyway. Yeah, Nick, anyway. going back to yours, Nick, like if they customize, like the the reality is that to get the even kind of pricing they already get, it's based on mi- building millions and millions of these. So they can't yeah. let you customize out all these different things because then the cost actually starts to go up instead of down. And so, right. you know, I this is the first iPhone. I think I have the seven. <laughs> And uh, it's the first iPhone I've ever purchased because I've always had like corporate phones or or something like that. And so I still owe so much money on this that I'm not getting a phone for like two or three more years. Like I couldn't believe how expensive it was. Like, are you kidding me? Like, I think the cost of phones is ridiculous. I mean, they do a lot, but man, that's just a lot of money for to expect people to pay. I think it's crazy that they're not getting cheaper and cheaper. Yeah, they're they're actually getting more expensive, which is which is crazy. But I mean, but the truth of the matter is, like most people don't have to upgrade every year. It's really just those uh, those early adopter people that are upgrading every year, uh, <laughs> just because they want to have the latest and greatest. Um, so you know, shame on them um, for spending all that money. Um, they don't need it. They don't need it. Um, it's, a, it's a business expense. That's what I tell everybody. Um, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so uh moving on uh, speaking of expensive things uh, although i don't want i don't want to categorize these as expensive that that shouldn't be the tagline here uh cool i will say is the lebron hfr which is for the harlem fashion row these released maybe two weeks ago a couple weeks ago and they were a very it's a very unique sort of uh collaboration in the nike basketball world you don't usually see collaborations like this happen or this is like one of the you know er, an early time one of the first times i've seen a collaboration like this happen on the basketball side where they have a fashion house but not just a fashion house but a fashion house that's run by women um and women of color at that um now i think the shoe looks great i love the that they use the leather strapped i love the detailing um they were priced at 250 dollars and it the the really the most interesting thing about this story was that Nike basketball actually kicked off the LeBron 16 with a collaboration. And I, I, I thought, and you know, maybe I'm looking in this too much, but I think that kind of speaks volumes to maybe the direction that they're going in with the LeBron 16. I think they kind of tapped into it with the LeBron 15 with like the Kith collaboration. And maybe this is giving um maybe this is the focus of nike basketball heading back more in a lifestyle arena uh possibly or am i am i looking too deep into this one go ahead tiffany (laughs) nick Uh, (laughs) well i think you know we talked about it before that um you know lebron was definitely you know building more of a brand with the school in the equality shoes and like doing all of these things so i think it is a nice compliment to what he's already doing. And I think you're right. I think that, you know, they're trying to get them more street, more of the LeBrons on the street. And man, this is honestly the first LeBron shoe I've paid any attention to. I was in a different world working on other shoes. And this right. thing is beautiful. The details, the quality, like, man, it's robust. It's a robust shoe, but they really outdid themselves with this HFR. It's really beautiful. I can't wait to see just the 16 to see how it compares to it. But man, what a nice shoe. 
Yeah, I, I haven't seen it in person, but man, like from the images and stuff, it looks like an amazing shoe. And I think I think like you know, it it's, it does say a lot about the direction of not just LeBron, but probably like the direction of like the sneaker world in general, where you know, everything everything in life is becoming more and more personal, so to speak, right? Like you buy a pair of shoes because you really like that athlete or you really like that you know person that that athlete collaborates with or you know you you you, like even like the places that you eat like you see on social media like the people that run the places the the people that work in the places everything you know as crazy as like we've moved into this like digital space I feel like everything is kind of coming back inwards in a sense where people are looking for like a real like personal meaning behind why they support businesses, why they support, you know, athletes or athlete shoes, whatever that is. And I think this is just like the the start of it. And, you know, to your point, Jacques, about like the 15 and the direction they took that, you know, in like this, like more, um, I mean, obviously the, the Kith stuff, but like more like a nostalgic approach to the colorways and stuff. And I think we'll see mm-hmm. see I think we'll see more of that, but I think we'll see even more of these like cool, this is what LeBron does outside of basketball and let's get them involved in creating a shoe in some way. You know, it's kinda like the John Elliott collab. Like I saw I think uh, they recent somebody recently posted probably LeBron posted like an orange pair of the John Elliott um, shoe, which I can't remember the actual name of that shoe, but um, I just uh, yeah, it's the uh, the icon. Yeah, the icon, that's right. And I, I just see that as like, you know, it's something that like LeBron is pretty fashionable off the court and for him to tie all these worlds together is just more and more valuable for himself. But it also helps build the brand at Nike and like the LeBron line as it grows too. what I, yeah, I think that br- go ahead, Tiffany, what I was going to say, what I particularly love is the fact that we're talking about as a collab, we're not talking about it as a women's collab and that's really what it is. It's just a collab because they did a really great job at this collab, right? Like right. this women's collab is fantastic. You, you know, you compare it to the Vogue one, which also became available this week. And that one just, it's its hard to relate to the Vogue one. Where this one, LeBron talks about his mom and you have those four amazing fashion designers and like it just resonates, you know, if you guys saw the sock liner on it, uh, they, they printed words. I think it was like dignity, loyalty, and a couple other words. Yeah. And one of the designers said, you know, it's like you're standing on that, that's your foundation. And it's like, oh, what an awesome story. Excellent mm-hmm. job, you know, what a great collab. Yeah, it was, it was a really, really well done, you know, hand, you know, kudos to, to that entire team for putting that together. I think they really kind of bridged the gap and, and made a, a shoe like that, really what you said, Tiffany, that goes beyond what we normally see and what we normally expect um from a collaboration it's not just a color change it's a material change uh they have that huge like lion on the back with like the mane and it's just it's just really beautifully done and you know hats off to them for really pushing the envelope i really i really love it um and it sold out i wish i really wish they made it in men's sizes but unfortunately it was only available in women's sizes but you know I can't complain. As many men's shoes are shoes are made for men, so I guess I really shouldn't complain about stuff like that. We, um, could, we could cut your toes off. I mean, <laughs> right? I'm saying I could I could squeeze into I could squeeze into a ten and a half. I think the, I think the biggest size was like a, a a ten eleven or something like that, or or, or eleven and a half or twelve or something like that in women's, which. Yeah, that's yeah, just destroys my feet. <laughs> um, just speaking of that, Tiffany, um, are there typically women's sizes that go up like the that's you don't typically get a women's size past like a, a 10 or 11 right um in some of the basketball shoes you do they go up to 12 um but that that might be the max because they just have them flip over to the men's sizes and in general usually they're just the men's shoes anyways so um it's kind right. of a blurry line it's more on the the smaller end so if you're a woman that's under a size men's seven you have a really hard time finding shoes like you only have a few women's shoes to pick from and you can't get like the latest kobe or anything like that because they just don't make them small enough unless you get the kids but it's different technology you know yeah. it's it's completely different technology most of the time yeah and th- i know they were there was an effort to kind of keep the young athletes uh the tech and the young athlete sizes the same as the the men's sizes but i don't no, it doesn't seem like that continued. Um, seems like that kind of fizzled out a little bit, unfortunately. 
Um, yeah, but, that was interesting because that was like what maybe like a year and a half, two years ago or something. I feel like. Yeah, I thought yeah, there was a whole story I think they did around with the LeBron. Of, yeah, like that they were going to keep those technologies throughout, you know. And I think, I think that's kind of an interesting thing. Like, do we, will we ever see, you know, like, obviously, kids is is different because you're talking about you know parents spending the money on kids shoes, the kids growing out of the shoes. It's not like something that you know, most people are willing to invest that kind of money into, um, at, at the same level of, um, you know, th- that adults would spend sh- on, but like, is there, I-, I feel like there's obviously plenty of women buying footwear, maybe not as many sneakers, but is there that big of a difference in the cost of technology f- to fit into those sizes, Tiffany? Like, you know, like, like let's say you know if if all things were equal and the first lebron 16 came out and it was the exact same design in a men's you know run of of sizes is there a big cost difference in that or do you know yeah i mean if you look at the 16 the airbag the air the midsole that's in there is three airbags they look like they're all like permanently attached it's not like just three different sizes of airbag um, if it's three different sizes, it becomes easier, right? Because as you get smaller, you can just put in smaller airbags. But if it's an entire midsole, you got to remember for every single size to half size, you're opening up a new set of tooling. And if you're going to open a new set of tooling and you're only going to sell, I don't even know what the numbers are, like a couple, th- a few thousand pairs, is it worth it? You know, that's, that's kind of the balance you have to make. So you have to, plus kids sizes are generally cheaper, right? They're not at the same price point. They're at a lower price point. Right. So you have a lot of different dynamics to balance. And then on top of that, some of the technologies are built for like men's in basketball, you know, they're built for men's 10, men's 13. And so if you have a kid that's a, a men's six wearing a technology that's just made smaller, you know, a lot of times maybe it's way too stiff for them. Maybe it's way too much structure or support for them, especially in basketball. So like you have those different dynamics that you have to kind of play with uh, to kind of get it all to balance out. That's interesting. I guess you never really think about it in that way. I, I, that, But now that you say that, it makes me think of, uh, I did a video with uh, with Jason Maiden for Super Heroic, and he was kind of talking about how the shoes are are specific for like that age, and like they're made a certain way with a certain amount of give and freedom for their movement of their foot and things like that, and doesn't have the sort of structure that other shoes do have. Hmm. Um, it's interesting to see it applied in that way, but that makes sense. It makes it may, it makes sense, I guess. And I know I know. And didn't we see that about the younger kids from a couple of couple of shows ago, where uh, kids that wear shoes early run fast? Was it shoes yeah. early run faster? Yeah, yeah it was flexibility. It was like it, the more yeah. flexible the shoes are, the kids learn like the biomechanics faster, and they d- their learning develops faster. So like free, imagine like a shoe like that. And then there was yeah. uh, one where the shoes were s- like running shoes. The kids could sprint faster. And then there was one about yeah. jumping, jumping higher. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, that is that is interesting. Wow. I got to go back and read that article. Uh, if you guys remember about that episode, make sure you guys leave us a comment down below. Uh, now, something that I've been kind of getting into a little bit are dress shoes. Now, as a sneaker guy, I've obviously um, – for the sort of sneaker look to my shoes, but Cole Haan has come out with some very futuristic shoes. Now, for those that don't know, uh, Nike used to own Cole Haan, uh, what, five years ago, seven years ago, something like that? Some- and they, they sold they sold off the company, and Cole Haan is on their own now, or they're with another company, but they had what was called the Lunar Grand, which I absolutely loved where they took lunar and put basically put lunar on the bottom of a dress shoe and like changed the colors and made it really pop and it kind of gave dress shoes this sneaker sort of appeal and made them in my mind pop a little more and it looks like they're kind of going back to those sort of roots with the zero grand three the kohan three zero grand um they're supposed to be really comfortable they're going to have this oxford style pricing is a little well they're really pricey they're 270 dollars and I think they're they're a more they're a fashion forward take on dress shoes. Um, 
I know you two uh, have a bit of a uh, different opinion <laughs> in regards to these. Um, so feel free to jump in. But I, I, I like them. I think I think they look good. Will I pay two seventy? I don't know. But I think but I like it. I mean, I, I, I don't dislike them. I think that they are just not a replacement for like a dress shoe like you know i you know way back in the day um i worked in sales for at&t and you know like i would never be able to get away with wearing a shoe like this just because it's it looks too much like a sneaker where you know you would probably want to have like your traditional like hard bottom shoe um is is more low-key i guess you know and i and i think like price wise People are, people are spending two to three hundred dollars on on you know hard bottom dress shoes. It, that's probably common. I think like for people that are into sneakers, stepping out of that kind of comfort zone of sneakers and and moving into a quote dress shoe for that price point is probably a little bit more um, of a of a you know mindset to be in to get to that. But like I, I think the shoe looks really cool. I don't think it's like a, a I think the original zero grand was really awesome. It basically took like the you know almost everything about like your traditional dress shoe and just made it lighter and more comfortable and that to me was like a huge win this i feel like i don't know if cole han has the following in that is needed to kind of compete in this space because it almost looks like you know like a, a y3 or you know something some, something high end you know like it, it kind of even like some of them kind of have like that um you know, you're competing in a space with like, like let's say, Y3 or maybe even like the John Geiger, like the the first shoe that he did, which was like kind of like sneaker but super high end materials, and and then you know yeah. like you're looking at like a lot of the stuff that's like you can get a handmade shoe for that price. I don't know. To me, it just seems like I don't I don't see a lot of people going down this path. I think it's interesting. I mean, I, of course, like Cole Haan when they merged with Nike or when Nike bought Cole Haan because then you had air and the heels and shoes, which made them drastically more comfortable. But for this, I mean, it's really I think what we're seeing here is really blurring the lines between dress shoes and sneakers. And it makes me ask the question, you know, at, at more formal businesses like Wall Street and stuff, is it OK to wear sneakers now? Like are, are people's um, just getting more lax you know in portland here you know you can kind of wear whatever you want i don't know that there's anywhere where you actually have to wear dress shoes but uh i know a lot of other businesses where there's a bit of a dress code you know so um i like it when they have the leather uppers but when they go to that fuse to me it's just all sneaker um yeah. and i do not right. like the medial side so the inside of the shoe i do not like that look like it totally that midsole looks bulbous and it looks it just looks weird to me where the lateral side or the outside, it, I think it looks OK. But if you look at the bottom view, those shoes are narrow and long, like getting the right size in these might be an issue. Do you see how narrow they are? Yeah, yeah, they are. They are thin. But I, I mean, typically, it seems like dress shoes are, are usually typically pretty thin, at least the ones that I've that I've had it that I have. Um, and I, I think when I say I like these, I should be very specific. I like the chucker boot and the wingtip. Uh, the fuse Oxford is not necessarily, um, the one that I, that I like. And even, and even to be honest, the wingtip, it's, it's more, it's more outsole that I want. Um, than I would want. I think the, the, the perfect combination is really in the chucker. I think the chucker really kind of represents the best of this world for this shoe. But, um, I get what you guys are saying. I, get, I definitely get what you guys are saying. I, got, I, I like the mix. I like the like the thought when they had the Lunar Grand. I love the way that that kind of represented the shoe, but they kind of kept it pretty traditional as far as the look of the shoe. It was just more like the colors as far as like the lines go and the shape of the outsole and the size of the outsole. That seemed to stay pretty consistent to what we are used to. But with these... Um, they've kind of just thrown that all out of the window. Um, I welcome, I welcome it. I'll say that. Um, but it is, it is a little further than I would like them to go though. I, I, I would wear, if I had to wear any of them right now, it would definitely, uh, be the Chaka. but you know, that's just, that's just my, my sneaker style trying to get into my dress style. So that's, that's how it works. $320. <laughs> 
I know the Chuck is 320, which is crazy. He's used to it. Jet, the jet th- setting can't use other people's headphones. <laughs> AirPod <laughs> issues. Three hundred and twenty dollar dress shoes. The fu- the funny thing is, like the wingtip is more expensive than the chukka. The wingtip is three to four hundred dollars, and the chukka is three twenty, which is, I mean, I guess I imagine that has to do with the leather that's on the upper, but. But even still, I was just like, so that ma- that that gives me a question for you, Tiffany. Like, let's say you know, like obviously a wingtip, you know, primarily like uh, this style is a little different than traditional wingtips. But Cole Haan has made like a wingtip, like you know, shaped like a traditional wingtip shaped shoe all the way through like the original Lunagrands, and then they have their own you know hard bottoms, and it, how much. Like if 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 they're doing that, are they able to cut costs over the years to then bring in this other, you know, let's say this outsole that they're midsole outsole combination that they're working? Obviously, it's a way different and drastic change. So there's a lot of shape changing that has to happen. But is there a way for them to to like utilize that in a in a I guess in a technology sense? I don't I don't know if that's the right question, but. Um, hopefully you understand I mean, I, what I'm I asking. Think, <laughs> yeah, I think it, what you're asking is, can you just take that upper th- and just keep making those and just put it on that other tooling? Is that is that right? I mean, and kind of. Get it's, a cost it, reduction? At, at, least, at least to some extent, right? Like, I know that there's going to have to be, like, this is not like a traditional, you know, midsole tooling. So obviously that's not going to, but like, let's say, you know, from the like regular hard bottom to that like Lunar Grand so where it's almost i think i'm i I don't have a pair like near me but i feel like it's even stitched in in the same way that like like your traditional like you know boot or shoe is made so moving from that to the lunar the original lunar brand outsole or midsole tooling seems like they would at least be able to kind of transition that in a more uh, more affordable way than transitioning to this one if that makes sense yeah, most likely not because those like just kind of like what you're saying, those leather bottoms, uh, traditional bottoms of shoes, they are so old and made so much that the cost is probably relatively cheap. You know, it's all about the handwork that's done on those, which there's a yeah. lot of handwork on them and the material quality. But like switching to molded um, foam based materials, I would imagine their cost to get into that is probably pretty significant. And then you have to keep in mind that you know, dress shoes usually have a leather strobel in them. And it's not a strobel, mm-hmm. it's board. It's called a board last, right? Which usually negates all of your cushioning underneath anyway. So it didn't matter to that it was leather. There was really no cushioning in there. But now that they're switching to these softer foams and materials, they have to switch from a board last to a strobel. Otherwise, you're, you're not going to feel it very much. So I'm curious to know if in this shoe, if it's board lasted or strobled, I would assume it's strobled. So that's a new technology for them. That's a new machine set of equipment. Um, so no, I don't think they probably can go down in costs. Interesting. Pro- probably not at all. And also the, the dress shoes also have a level of quality and a level of like refined detail to them to where, you know, if your mold is flashing a little bit or your mold you know, the edges aren't quite pristine press, that's gonna be a problem on these shoes. Um, and so they, they, I think they basically have a little bit higher quality standards than your everyday sneaker company. Got it. Right, that makes yeah. sense. That makes sense. And that yeah. stitch- I always wonder about that. The stitch you like is usually fake. Oh, really? Depen- oh. Depends on the shoes. Wow. Well, there's another dream. <laughs> Tossed into the wind. Crushing cool. dreams, cool. one day at a time. Crushing dreams, <laughs> <laughs> one dream at a time. <laughs> I love it, but that's good to know, though. Like this is all stuff. As a sneaker guy, obviously, this is kind of stuff. I feel like I should know, like these sort of these sort of details. I feel like it makes me a better makes me a better sneakerhead, and it makes me more informed <laughs> when I'm getting. What I, no, when I'm serious, when I'm getting like custom shoes or stuff like that, or I'm getting doing one off shoes and getting one off shoes made. Um, I think that sort of stuff is important. So I think I, I love I love hearing this kind of stuff. I think that's going to be my new tagline for my YouTube channel. Be a better sneakerhead. <laughs> Knowledge. Better there sneaker head. Something. There you go. No, it's dope. <laughs> yeah, I, I like it. that. I love it. OK, so uh, moving on to sports. Uh, so for those that know about the U.S. Open, uh, 
Naomi Osaka won, and um, there was a little bit of a um, a mishap with uh, Serena and the referees, um, and a lot of uh, there's been a lot of back and forth about it, and it looks like uh, there was a news article today that the the officials came out saying that um, they're boy they may they're considering I'm sorry they there's a report that they're considering boycotting Serena's matches now there's a lot of back and forth about this online and um i just don't recall there being an instance when officials said they would boycott a person's matches um that was a man so yeah i'm gonna i mean i think it's put i think it's just it's just garbage like Especially like we talked about it, you know, last week or whatever with tennis and them being so like uptight about everything. And for this to come out like, like for one, like I don't think that Serena said anything inappropriate to the official. Like regardless of their opinions on the rules and what was done, like I don't think she said anything that was like over the top aggressive like especially for as upset as she was and if you look at like tennis and you just like i mean nike's tennis brand was built on john McEnroe, who cussed at every official for 20 years (laughs) and there was never this talk of like oh we're gonna we're gonna quit being officials when he's around like i just think that's crap i mean it's it's like to the point where I, i just can't I don't know. Like, I can't talk about it even without getting frustrated about it because it's just like, like, what the hell is going on here? You know? I mean, I, I love it. Like, I didn't know that article was out there until you just mentioned it. And that's awesome. Great. This is the revolution tennis needs. Go ahead and boycott Serena Williams and you're going to see an uproar in the tennis community. And I will bet you that Nike supports it. Like she was, she will not be left out to dry and not play tennis again that would never happen i mean this is this is the revolution we keep talking about in tennis like they need to update they need to get with it and there's definitely a sexism issue there like it's very clear she pointed it out clear as day you know she may have went on a little bit too much about it but she wasn't wrong. You know, I agree with you, Nick. She didn't say anything like compared to John McEnroe. <laughs> I mean, I mean, but no one would boycott his matches because it was just fun to watch. Right. It was enter- it became entertaining at some point, you know, instead yeah. of like abrasive. So it's going to get interesting. I, I hope they do. I noticed it was anonymous umpire, so he wasn't willing mm-hmm. to put his name out there. So that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to know yeah, where. Apparently. I would like to know where the female umpires sit. Like, where are they at? What do they think? How, you know, what's their opinion? Yeah, and I think a lot of the beef goes to because the uh, the um, the UTA sided with her um, in saying that they did feel that it was that it was a little harsh and that there was there was was being sexist. So I think then you know they the umpires are this umpire in particular felt kind of left out. And, and who knows, you know, I, I tweeted about this the other day because it's reportedly and considering. And those are two very vague <laughs> words. Um, yeah. So you never know if, if there's any truth, any truth to this at all. It's it like could be just TMZ. one umpire. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It could be like this one umpire that they talk to. So uh, Washington Post. But I, and I feel like the Washington Post would do a little more research than that. But, yeah. you know, just put it, just putting that out there that, you know, one person. Anyway, all right, moving on to something that's really going to affect all of us. Um, There was a new law passed in the European Union that could really change the way we use the Internet as we know it. And it's a really interesting law. And I agree with it and I disagree with it. And um, I'll try to explain a little bit. The law kind of basically has to do with one, like with referral traffic. Um, about how traffic is referred to sites and how Google, basically, if you Google, if you Google maybe the history of the Air Jordan One and you find my video, Google needs to pay me if you click the link to go to my video. On one side, that's great, awesome. Google pays me for the traffic that they get from me for free. Um, but at the same time, 
um, if Google decides they don't want to pay people, um, that could considerably lower content for different publishers that don't have a name, so to speak, uh, as far as searching goes. The other part of it is copyright. And this is something um, for those of you that don't know, I, I was I was formerly an artist and um, copyright and music and things like that are something that's really, really near and dear to me. And I do. I still feel like musicians aren't paid their just due. Um, and I feel like copyright is kind of trounced upon a bit in today's Internet world. Um, at the same time, I understand the free flowing of knowledge and creativity and how that encourages other creativity and things like that. But there needs to be a balance. And I think that's what this law is trying to establish, a bit of a balance and to stop the outright abuse of copyright, which um, is something that there is there's an issue. Um, the, the people's copyright are, are not respected these days. And that is an issue. A lot of people, they use copyright. That's like their creativity. That is their 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 thought process. It is their ideas put on paper or put into song or put into a picture. And they should be monetary. They should monetarily benefit off of their ideas. Um, and it's just it's just a really interesting law. Um, I'll let you guys. I'll, I'll, I'll stop ranting here. Um, as you can tell, the, the passionate artist to me is, it has risen up. So I'll let you guys kind of jump in here and kind of give your perspective on it as well. Just you know what you guys think of what's going on. I, I mean, I, I think that it's you know it's a tough it's a tough situation, right? Like I, I 100% agree with you. Like there's been so many things that I've done that were literally just copied onto some other website. You know, and I have no way of like fighting that other than like reaching out to the people that posted it and saying, hey, like you literally just copied and pasted this from, you know, someplace that I wrote it. And I know a lot of people that have worked with me and for me over the past like 10 to 12 years have had that same issue. Um, I think that there's there's a lot of different ways that you can look at it, because in, in one sense, like you want people to be able to share stuff and be excited about it, right? Like, especially in sneakers, the business is driven so much by like, oh, wow, new this, new that. And at the same time, you know, we, we, we all see a handful of accounts that literally just take pictures and post them without ever crediting where that photo came from, you know, who, like ever like they never tag anybody and i think that's the like at the at its core for like at least when social media is the biggest challenge is to like like I, I think that there's a lot of people that if they knew where something came from would happily post hey i got this from here kind of things um but i think that in general like this law and if this kind of thing were to happen in the u.s and like whatever this is going to change is so it's from from reading this article it seems like it's so aggressively over the top like there's a line in here that says um under the article 11 which is the law a user would need a news publisher's permission to share a news story's full headline like keep in mind right now you go to the new york times or soul collector or wherever you go to you hit share on one of those you know social media buttons and it literally copies and pastes the title of the article and a link to the article onto twitter instagram facebook wherever you want to share it like they're saying that you would have to get permission from that so part of me thinks like well technology might be able to do that right technology might be able to say oh this this link was clicked on the actual site from the new york times therefore it's you know they've already said we want you to share this but on the other hand if that can't be done with technology like this could just throw everything off about everything that we consume on the internet yeah i think it's uh, i agree like this man this throws us a wrench in things a little bit um but like if eu passes it this is like a technical question if the eu passes it like doesn't mean the U.S. has to pass it. So do we end up with, like, two different versions of the Internet? Or, I mean, we kind of already have that now with, you know, China, sort of. So, yeah. I mean, how? Yeah. what happens there? I mean, because that's interesting because, like, then you could actually see, I mean, this is taking even further. Like, if it's beneficial, then you can see people moving to Europe because they can actually make 
uh, you know, a life off their their actual original artwork. Yeah, exactly. Um, where right now, you know, they get they just get it taken. You know, like I think of the the unicorn. Did you did you mention this? Uh, the unicorn <laughs> that Elon Musk uh, did in Tesla. Like there was the farting unicorn, and uh, he put oh, it in the car. Oh no, I didn't know this. Yeah, so this was oh, wow. a couple months ago. An artist, he had gotten a mug and there was an art, an artist made this, this unicorn that's like fi- farting rainbows or something like that. And so right. um, Elon put it into the dashboard of the cars, of the Tesla cars, and never properly compensated him. And so there was wow. a big, you know, disagreement about it. And um, finally, Tesla compensated him. Uh, correctly for it but I mean a major brand just did it you know like hello yeah. like it's go- it's yeah. it's out of control you know it's out of control on some level yeah and that and that, and that kind of speaks to like the world today where um, I think we we've, we've grown up with with the internet where if it, it uh, there's a feeling that that kind of stuff is okay um, they didn't grow up in a world I mean most people that you know that share these sorts of things today they don't realize that that's someone else's intellectual property and that there's a value attached to that, especially if you're getting value out of that. I see there's these Instagram accounts that just take videos and make jokes out of them all of the time. And it just like, it just shakes me to my core. I'm just like, Oh my God. Like, and, and they don't even credit, like they don't even have the gall, like they don't even have the, the decency, I should say to credit back to the original video. Yeah. And I'm just like, yo, like, how are you, like, do you understand, like, you're benefiting off of somebody else's work? I, I try to, like, I try to explain that to people. It's like, almost like you wrote a, a paper and turned it in and everyone in the class got a copy of your paper and just put their name on it and maybe rearrange the paragraphs and they're turning that in as well. And they're getting just as much credit as you are. And um, I mean, people like you wouldn't accept that in school. Like you would be pissed if someone was copying your work after you spent m- months or years putting all that work together, and someone just takes your work and gets credit for it. And not and not only gets credit for it, can make a living off of it, off of your work. Basically, they sit around, you do the work, they sit around and just turn it in, and they get credit for it. So yeah, yeah, it's- I just think that's a. Yeah, I, I agree totally. And and even like like we've seen this with several shoe launches now, like there's something gets posted online, like okay, so that that mag, that Nike mag shoe that went for ninety two thousand, one of the original shoes from the movie, right? I watched that very closely to see what people were saying about it. And all the articles said different things. And other than the the one or two articles that actually talked to the person selling the shoe, the rest of them just kinda added information that wasn't accurate. And so then now you have all this false information or this fake news also going on, but they're doing it so it makes it look like they have authentic content when it's, yeah. it's not. Just 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 give credit and and I would rather them give credit to someone and repost versus you know like just just changing two things and it not even being accurate at that point because it doesn't seem like people's credibility starts to get damaged either anymore because there's so many people saying so many different things about any any given topic you don't know what's true yeah it's it's an interesting it's an interesting world and these these laws if they actually do go into effect could really change everything from all those people that post memes with pictures of other people. (laughs) Um, I mean, think about, think about the, um, the, um, the, what did they call it? The congratulations baby. When the little fist pump Mm. baby, (laughs) like, like, like imagine if everyone had that posted, that meme had to pay for that meme. Like that kid be fine. He'd be in caught like that pay for his college or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like, but people don't, they don't think about it that way. They just think, oh, this is cool. I'm going to post it and not really think about the impacts and how that affects them. But yeah. Anyway, so that is something you guys, everyone listening should be be keeping an eye on because it could literally change the way the internet, spe- and especially social media, the way special social media uh, happens and the way that information is, is spread on social media. It could really change the whole game in that regard. Um, with that being said, uh, keeping it moving, um, yesterday uh, was 9-11, and um, as someone that is not a native New Yorker, I know how it was affected me, and I just want to, you know, 
we just want to kind of just say we we want to recognize the day and and let um, those first responders know and the people that died in in 9/11 know um, that we're praying for them, praying for their families, and um, we we definitely appreciate their sacrifice. And um, I don't know if Tiffany or Nick, if you guys want to jump in and say something there, uh, but I just thought that we should definitely mention that because the day just passed. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's one of those things where like everyone was impacted by it um and you know like it's just uh it's something that you know i think shouldn't be forgotten and i think that you know uh, i i have friends that had you know that that lived in new york at that time that had family that were you know directly impacted from some of the stuff that happened and i think that you know like we just got to make sure that like we acknowledge that and pay respects to those people. And, um, like you said, praying for them and sending positive thoughts to them and, and their families and loved ones. Yeah. Likewise. I mean, heavy heart on nine 11 always. And, uh, yep. I, I hope that the recovery process is going well for those, um, that were directly involved and those who lost folks. And so, yeah, just, just great Jacques to call it out and, uh, say we're thinking about you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so before we get out of here today, there is one last sneaker that we actually want to talk about. And it's a very interesting sneaker. And this came up actually right before we were going to start the show. There was, and the irony of all of this is just like, I don't think it can get any more ironic. There was an Air Jordan 1 that was spotted at a resale shop called Restock Chicago. And the shoe is basically saying, don't resell me. Um, and it was leaked by a resale shop. And it's just, I, I don't know, my mind's just blown with the irony here. But literally on the midsole, it says not for resale. On the inside, it says no L's. On the toe box, it says please crease. On the heel, it says no photos. On the inside, it says, sorry, this pair is not numbered, general release only. And it's just, I, I, I love it, <laughs> but at the same time, I just can't get over the fact that it was leaked by a resale shop. <laughs> just, I don't, <laughs> yeah. I, I, That's I, the personality, right? Like, this is the kind of funny, weird stuff Nike <laughs> used to do all the time, right? Like, weird stuff like this. Oh my gosh! And that's, so, do you, is this marketing? Is this good marketing? And I've just fallen for it here. Is this, is this something that they got? They got these over to a a, a resale shop and had the, them quote unquote leak the images. I mean, they did, or someone like one of the customizers did. I mean, I wouldn't doubt that this could be a customizer thing. I mean, it's pretty funny. Um, I I think it's yeah. I think if it came from Brand Jordan, it's a great marketing thing. <laughs> So and I hear that this pair is actually, from what I understand, there's this black and yellow pair, and then there's going to be a red accented pair as well, and they're going to release this holiday season, and I'm just, I, I mean, I love it, I love it. It's like a a, a shot at the resellers. Um, they even say wear me on the tongue. This is it's just amazing. Like I love it. This is I feel like this is the shoe for all the OG sneakerheads <laughs> that are just like that are not really into this resale game. They're like, yeah, like, yeah, tell them, Jordan, you let them know that ain't what this that ain't what this is about. It's about the culture. It's about the love for the game. And these young boys are like, yeah, it's about my pockets. Yeah. It's about me doubling up. So well, it's interesting. Yeah. Go ahead. The, well, the not for resale, though, I mean, that's that's a legitimate like legal action. Like, I believe they can take legal action if you sell a shoe that says not for resale and there's a record of it. Right. Like it's. It's part of like oh. a, a legal thing, I would believe. Like we'd have to get a lawyer on here to tell us for sure. But so that would make me wonder if this was really from the brand because, you know, like if it literally says it on the shoe and it's not like an artist's um, interpretation of something, like, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I mean, think that I, could devalue the other shoes that actually say not for resale, you know, like they're, they, they might as well not stamp that on shoes anymore period, because they just took the piss out of it themselves, you know? So <laughs> I, I think there could it's, be a legal conversation there. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, but also to be clear, like the shoes that would have had that on them prior to like this one fr directly from Nike would have been like sample production sample. Like, you know, like this is a, this is a part of 
like creating those shoes that's why it's not for resale right where this being like like clearly it's it's like a pun like it's playing on the whole you know like we'll look back at this like 10 years from now and be like remember when they made fun of all of us for like you know no photos and you know please please crease my, the toe box and no l's on the insole and all that stuff because it's 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 really yeah. like specific to this time time in like the sneaker world so to speak or you know and i think like that's the interesting part about it like i don't i can't imagine that like you know i i, I agree with you tiffany like legally that you're probably right we would have to get a lawyer but i would i would lean towards like that being the case but I think it's also like just like to, uh, you know, to kind of play on the the culture and like like Jacques talking about that like kind of like drastic differences between like you know the old school and like the the new like you know reseller like you know the secondary market being so big now compared to what it was you know five years ago or ten years ago is it's like tongue in cheek so you know so I I think like. I don't know. Like, I think that the, I think like, you know, Jordan ones always look cool in the right color blocking. So that to me is like, you know, regardless of what it says and how, like, it'll probably be popular. Um, but it would be interesting to see. I mean, obviously, if it's coming from her, you know, we're seeing photos. They say no photos. It's at a resell shop in Chicago, you know, people are going to buy it. Like, this is just how it's going to work. And, you know, uh, I don't, I, the, the interesting, the interesting thing for me, I'm thinking about this now. Um, this is kind of like a walking inside joke, basically, because if you wear these out, no one, unless they're into sneakers, is going to understand oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, everything like that's on this yeah. shoe. Yeah, because it says no photos, please crease, wear me. Um, this is not for resale. Like, if unless you're a sneakerhead, people are going to be like, what are you like? What is what does that mean? <laughs> they're going to they're going to ask. They're going to ask you, what does that mean about your shoes? And I, 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 I don't think I would ever wear these to anywhere besides like a sneaker event, because otherwise people would be asking me questions. Yeah, I agree. Yep. That's interesting. <laughs> anyway, so see, see what you did, resellers. <laughs> Now I've got to wear shoes and have people asking me questions. I got to talk to people in public. You know how awkward that is. <laughs> anyway, when your AirPods don't work and your dress shoes are too expensive, yeah. right. you travel too much, and now people are talking to you. What the hell? Now I got to talk to people. What kind of world? Yeah, is this? coming from the guy who, anyway. who's recording himself on camera in the airports and hotels that he stays at. <laughs> True, true, true. <laughs> uh, but, I, but I don't have to talk to anybody. Um, anyway, with that being said, hey, 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 this is the Outside the Box podcast. We are so thankful for all of you guys listening. I am Jacques Slade. You can find me at Cousteau, K-U-S-T-O-O, all over the internet. That's Instagram. That's on Twitter. Uh, that's on YouTube. On Facebook, it's Jacques Slade, which is my full name. And then on Tinder, it's Sneaker Lover. 27 <laughs> so if you want to find me there that's where i am ladies uh and, and hey and you know what guys if you're interested holler uh i don't know where i don't know where this is going uh so i'm gonna pass this off told you i get it the conversation automatically gets awkward and it turns into a train wreck so uh before this show this show gets any worse with me talking i'm gonna pass it off to my co-host nick engvall uh yeah i don't really know how to follow that up at all so i'm just gonna say uh you can follow me nick engvall n-i-c-k-e-n-g-v-a-l-l on all platforms and sneaker history at sneaker history on all platforms but really like i said i'm just learning like i did today about the cole han uh last from tiffany so tiffany let them know how they can find you uh tiffany beers you can find me on youtube and instagram at tiffany t-i-f-f-a-n-y beers b as in boy e-r-s and if i don't have tinder so if someone will go ahead and look up jock's <laughs> profile and send it to me i would love to see that <laughs> I'm just saying, <laughs> swipe on sneaker lover twenty seven. Holler at your boy. Uh, if that's not if that's your name, guys, <laughs> if that's not no. your name, it's gonna be hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Sneaker Lover 27. Uh, yeah, so uh, make sure you guys follow us outside pods. There, uh, We're on Instagram and on Twitter. Feel free to uh, leave us any feedback, comments, or anything that you want to talk to us about. Uh, we appreciate you guys, and we'll see you or hear, talk, touch, feel uh, you in the uh, next week. And oh, wait, sorry. And before we go, uh, I do want to say no one has asked us for relationship advice <laughs> and we're a little upset about that. So the offer, we're putting the offer back out there. If you need any relationship advice, come to the Outside the Box podcast. We've got everything you need. All right, guys, we'll see you soon. Peace.